Good morning, Texas Realtors. Thank you for joining us on day three of the first ever virtual Shaping Texas Conference. I'm Brandi Guthrie, your 2020 Chair of the Texas Realtors Political Involvement Committee. We have a lot of ground to cover this morning, so let's get right to it. This session is packed with incredible speakers who have their fingers on the pulse of our state's political and legislative futures. We saw in last night's centennial celebration, realtors across the state have been making positive changes in the real estate industry for more than 100 years. Realtors make a difference in the communities we serve and in the relationships we build with individuals every day. One of the most direct ways we do this is by getting engaged in local, state, and federal issues. Because working in real estate means the process of crafting public policies and the elected officials who make those decisions impacts everything we do. This was extremely relevant earlier this year when the pandemic hit our state. Texas Realtors immediately engaged with state leaders to protect real estate consumers by ensuring that real estate was deemed as an essential service statewide. Then our association's leadership advised state officials on reopening government offices for real estate consumers. And we even worked to ensure that notary services could be expanded to allow transactions to move forward while complying with health and safety practices. But we didn't stop there. Realtor advocacy goes all the way to Washington, DC. So we're grateful now to hear remarks from our senior US Senator from Texas, John Cornyn, to provide an important update on federal legislation. Hi, I'm Texas Senator John Cornyn. I want to wish all of you a warm welcome to this year's Texas Realtors Conference. I'm sure it looks a little different than last year's gathering, but I commend you for participating amidst this new normal. First, heartfelt congratulations are in order on your 100th year anniversary. Thank you all for fighting tooth and nail for the real estate industry in our state. Here's to 100 more. As Texas continues to deal with the devastating impact of the coronavirus, I'm proud that we in Congress were able to provide relief in the form of the CARES Act. CARES, in addition to expanding unemployment benefits and providing direct financial relief to Texans, offered assistance for Texas businesses. The bill provided billions of dollars in emergency loans, bankruptcy relief, and a delay in the employer payroll tax, as well as a number of other provisions that small businesses need right now. While that's a good start, we're not out of the woods yet. And that's why the next round will hopefully include provisions like liability protections and more financial assistance for Texans and small businesses. I know times are tough, but as Congress continues to debate this next round of relief, I promise to continue the fight for the needs of Texas realtors and all Texans. So keep up the great work and stay safe out there. Thank you, Senator Cornyn. Realtors strongly supported the federal legislation Senator Cornyn mentioned, this was one of the many ways we have advocated for the real estate industry during COVID-19 pandemic. All of those measures and many others got us to where we are today. And now it's time to look forward. Before 2020 ends, we will have a presidential election with hundreds of important state and local races down the ballot. But it's a long road here to November 3rd. And there is so much to understand about the dynamics of certain races and party politics and demographics and civil unrest and voter behavior. Thankfully, we're joined today by some of the folks who will explain these issues and they deal with them every day. The Texas Tribune is the only nonprofit, nonpartisan news source in the state. They also have the largest bureau of reporters covering the Texas Capitol. Here with us today from the Texas Tribune are political, politics reporter Cassie Pollock, executive editor Ross Ramsey, political reporter Patrick Sivtek and Alexa Ura, who serves as an associate editor and, and demographics reporter. And we know that your month-long Texas Tribune Festival kicked off yesterday and y'all have pretty full schedules. So please know how much we appreciate you for being here. I'll be honest with all the Texas realtors in attendance today and say that we don't have any questions for this panel. Instead, given the fast moving nature of this election, we wanted to ensure that these folks were given you, Texas Realtors, the most relevant and timely information. So we've asked them to hit up several 
Up to the minute highlights they're seeing in Texas politics as we move ever closer to the November election. And for the realtors watching, feel free to put your questions in the Q&A box and we will do our best to ask as many as possible before our guests have to leave. Okay, Ross, Alexa, Patrick, and Cassie, please tell us what's going on in Texas politics to help us be informed citizens and most importantly, informed voters. Thanks a bunch. We really appreciate being here. This was kind of fun. This is a kind of the cast, kind of the rotating part of the rotating cast of the trip cast. If you listen to that every week um, and we just sort of freewheel these things and kind of talk like we do around our desks in the newsroom. So um, this is kind of the irreverent version of, of the way things go. You know, we've got all the things going on that you talked about. We've got, you know, four or five big storylines going at the same time, which is unusual in the news business. It's unusual in the country's business. And, you know, one of those lines is the election that's going to serve as kind of a referendum on all of the other things, whether we're talking about civil justice, policing, COVID, recession, any of those things, schools, all of this. Um, but I want to start this uh, with a conversation about the general election. We'll go through issues and some of the ballots, some of the voting issues, and then maybe talk about the legislative session a little bit. Uh, Let's just start at the top of the ballot. Patrick, let me start with you. Uh, since you're following presidential, um, some of the Texas polls have had Biden and Trump closer than you might think they would be in a red state. Can you kind of start us there and we'll go on? Yeah, uh, most of the public polling over the past several months, or I even say this year, uh, you know, has shown a pretty close race in Texas. I mean, just to put it in, in perspective, Trump won Texas in 2016 by nine percentage points, which was the small, even back then was the, you know, the smallest margin for a Republican presidential nominee in Texas in two decades. Um, so, you know, we're already working from a baseline that is uh, pretty historically, at least in recent history, pretty historically small. Um, and, you know, I think the important thing to keep in mind here is even if, um, e even if some of these public polls that show a very close race uh, are only half true, even if Trump is, is winning Texas by four or five points, that still has a tremendous impact down ballot. And I'm sure we're going to get to it. Um, but there are, you know, very high stakes farther down the further down the ballot in Texas. And so even if you're one of those people who don't believe polls and, and you think some of these uh, these polls that come out showing the, the race pretty close in Texas uh, may not be entirely reliable, even if they're half true, it's going to transform, I think, Texas politics pretty dramatically this cycle. Cassie, how does this translate? You know, we'll, we'll get into the details here, but you're watching the legislative races pretty closely. The House is in play here. Um, talk about that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, Democrats are hoping to build off of the dozen seats that they gained in 2018. They're effectively nine seats away from gaining control of the chamber, which would mark the first time in, I think, nearly two decades uh, that Democrats uh, would be able to, to run ship over there. And obviously, you'd have to counter that with uh, Dan Patrick's Senate and uh, a Republican in the governor's office. But uh, Democrats are pretty pumped and Republicans are aware uh, that maybe some of them were caught a little bit flat footed in 2018 uh, in some of these uh, North Texas races and other races kind of in other suburbs across the states. And so, uh, you know, they are across the state and they've been, um, you know, Republicans have been super aware of the uh, challenge more or less before them and that uh, Democrats controlling the chamber, uh, again, is a very uh, real possibility. Um, so you kind of uh, combine that with the polls that, that Svitek's talking about and the fact that this is going to be the first election without straight ticket voting, which uh, is more or less what, what plays into a lot of these lower ballot races. Um, so yeah, it'll be interesting for sure. The, the DCCC, the, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee, um, has got, I think, 10, K, 10 of the 36 congressional races in Texas on their list now. They started with six. They added, seven, they added another one. And then they just threw in uh, three or four more. Um, our Abby Livingston, who is our Washington bureau chief, uh, did an analysis of spending. And four years ago, the Republicans were outspending the Democrats in congressional races in Texas by twenty million dollars. Uh, at you know that was the fundraising at the middle of the year. This year, the Democrats are ahead by seven million dollars. And you know, I'm curious. You know, any of you can jump in on this, but I'm I'm curious whether you think the presidential race drives what happens in those congressional races or with the spending at the congressional level, if it's the other way around, do the, do the down ballot races drive the top? 
I'm a big believer at, at this point, based on what we know, that it's going to be vice versa in some of these major markets where some of these congressional races have become so high stakes and have drawn so much investment or will draw so much investment uh, that in some cases they may be more of a, a driver um, versus any investment that may be done at the presidential or even statewide level in some of these congressional districts. So, I'm, you know, for example, like the U.S. Senate race, like so, you know, it's probably safe to assume, for example, that in uh, the Houston market, there's going to be more spending at the congressional level uh, than there may even be at the, the U.S. Senate level, just because the number of targets in that area and the commitment that both sides have, have shown to the races in that market. Um, we'll see what the ultimate breakdown is, but that's just to say that I, I am actually a, a pretty big believer at this point, based on what we know, that some of these congressional races have gotten so large, so uh, you know, nationally targeted, and the, the you know, multi-million dollar commitments are already there for fall ad spending, uh, that they could be kind of uh, up ballot drivers of turnout on their own. You know, turnout's actually going to be one of the big issues in this race, as it always is. Um, but there's a lot in contest. And in some ways, Alexa, you've got the most important story of the election season, which is, you know, how do we vote? Can we vote? When do we vote? Uh, can you kind of walk through the, the minefield there? It's been, uh, I think you spend half your time in court now. <laughs> well, you know, I think just to piggyback off of the last question, I think one of the things that we don't know at this point is how all of the things that are happening now will play into voters' behavior. I think we we often go into elections thinking we know a little bit more about voting behavior than we actually do. And I think that's especially true in a moment like this where not only are people spectators to some of the biggest issues that are rolling out in front of us, but they're also being affected by it in personal ways, right? And I think there is a segment of voters or of Texans, particularly Hispanic Texans and low income Texans, the data shows that are being disproportionately affected by the pandemic. And I don't think we know how that plays out when it comes to going to the polls in November. And maybe that's immeasurable and maybe that doesn't play out and it's just something that I'm thinking about all the time. But I think as we think about people actually trying to cast the ballot, right? We talk about, will the house flip? Will Democrats be able to flip the state for the first time in however many years? None of those things happen if people can't actually cast their ballots. And so right now we are at a moment where I don't think we've had an election feel so uncertain from the voting standpoint uh, in, in many, many, many years. I would argue maybe even decades. So we've got county officials that are scrambling to replace polling sites that normally would work, but don't work in a pandemic. You've lost schools in some places. You've lost grocery stores in some places. We've got county officials scrambling to find enough poll workers to keep that level of polling locations open because they always go up uh, in November for a general election. And then of course, we've got a million lawsuits ongoing about the actual rules for voting and voting by mail, of course. And I think the reality is that we're getting so close to the election that the litigation might not actually end up playing into this election, which will make for sort of an interesting next day or next week story after the election if all of the fights that we have seen take up so much space leading into this election actually don't end up impacting it because we're so close, the deadlines, we're so close to all of the deadlines and the closer we get, the less likely it is for a court to want to intervene in the rules that, that are already in place. So the governor already extended early voting. I think it starts on October 13th. Um, the two things I wanted to ask you about in particular, uh, walk us you know, sort of quickly through voting by mail and, and how that works now. And also I, I want you to talk about how election night um, might last longer than 24 hours. Yeah, so, uh, you know, with voting by mail, it is this very lightly used uh, voting option in Texas. And that is for a reason. It's because it's very, the eligibility rules for it are very, very strict. You can only do it if you are 65 or older, if you're going to be out of the county that you're registered in during the entire election period. So for, for this election, that means six days earlier than usual up through election day. 
Um, you can use it if you are, if you cite a disability or an illness, which of course has been sort of the center of a lot of the litigation. The election code describes a disability or an illness in a much broader way than the average person might think of a disability being defined. It's not anything aligned with like social security or Medicaid or any sort of other definition. It's basically if you show up to the polls without, with, and you can't vote without needing assistance or the likelihood of injuring your health. And so we have this process that's very lightly used that county officials are very, very quickly trying to ramp up their capacity to do because all of a sudden you might have a huge upswing in voters who are using a process that you might have only accounted for a couple of people in your county using before. And by a couple, obviously that's relative if you're thinking of a Harris County versus a Willisie County. And so I think we are heading into an election where there without a doubt will be more use of mail-in voting, a system that not a lot of people use and that counties are not used to processing in high numbers. And then we're heading into an election where a lot of these races could be very close. And so those mail-in ballots could make a difference in a lot of ways. We're so used to calling elections on election night. Once we see enough precincts come in or enough vote centers come in in counties that have countywide voting, that is not going to be the case. And I think it's completely possible that we won't know if the House flipped for several days, if not a week until after the election, because this time around, we're gonna be waiting for mail-in ballots to come in the domestic ones can come in up until 5 p.m. the next day. We'll be waiting for international mail-in ballots to come in, which can come, which can come in until the next week. And we'll be waiting for counties to sort through provisional ballots, which in this year could be a lot of mail-in voters who didn't end up getting their ballots in time and go to vote in person instead. So it's going to be more like election week instead of election night. Right. Happy Thanksgiving, right? Uh... Uh, Patrick and Cassie, could you kind of walk us through the ballot and tell us what you think the, the big races are? You know, any, you can start anywhere on the ballot you want to. I'm just I'm curious what you two are going to be watching on election night, you know, either for um, for some kind of meaningful um, guidance or just, you know, for thrills. Um, what's 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 on your um, watch list? Cassie, take it away. Tech. Um I mean, you know, just kind of going back to this theme that we've been watching play out over the past few years, what's going to be happening in the suburbs? Uh, there's a handful of at least House members. I'm talking Jeff Leach, Matt Kraus, Tony Tinderholt, Matt Shaheen, Morgan Meyer, who uh, won their reelection bids in 2018 by just a couple percentage points. In Morgan Meyer's case, I think it was Svitek 300 votes, 200 something votes, maybe almost 300 and so, uh, you know, all of those members that I've just mentioned, they're, they're seriously trying to campaign this cycle. They're trying to fundraise. They're not taking their re-election bids for granted, uh, like maybe some of them did in 2018. So what's happening in all of those races? Are they getting, uh, you know, are, are they just totally getting blown away by their Democratic opponent? Are they winning re-election? Uh, you have a couple similar cases, or a few, I should say, in, in the Houston area, um, you know, in the suburbs over there. Um, so that's, you know, to me, something that just kind of sticks out uh, in terms of, you know, 2018 midterm, you're expecting maybe some of these uh, races to not go as, as planned or whatnot. And does that trend line continue or do they end up winning, you know, in some cases by double, uh, you know, double digits or whatnot? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Patrick, what are you watching? Yeah, I'll put in a plug for the U.S. Senate race. I know the, the conventional wisdom is a little more uh, in favor of the, the Republican in that race than is in some of these other, uh, you know, supposedly battleground races. But I think, um, you know, the way John Cornyn has approached this cycle is a little different than Ted Cruz did. Um, you know, the Cornyn campaign made a lot of moves early on to show that they weren't going to be caught off guard and that they were taking things seriously. Um, and throughout the cycle, I think that they've uh, affirmed and, and reaffirmed that. And so I know that there's not as much public polling. What public polling there is in that race, uh, you know, does show that it's, uh, you know, not a particularly tight race right now, uh, but within single digits. Um, and at the end of the day, you know, I think that that's going to also be subject to the, the presidential landscape. And so, um, you know, I'm very curious to see if, you know, as, as push comes to shove later in this fall, if there, if there is any separation that, that Cornyn is, is willing to show uh, with Trump or just the national Republican environment, or if he feels a need to. Um, something that I think is one of the most um, underlooked um, 
parts of this, uh, you know, kind of pre-fall uh, period so far is that Cornyn is already up on TV, um, has been, I think, for close to two weeks now with an ad uh, that is basically trying to get ahead of any political turbulence that may come from school reopenings uh, amid the pandemic. Um, and, you know, I think it's a, a smart move and we could debate, you know, his record and things he said in the past and the, and the merit and substance of that. Uh, but I think it's, it's one of it, it's been a little bit, uh, under, uh, underappreciated of, of a tactic by him so far, because if you talk to Texas Republicans, one of the, I think, big concerns they have, or one of the big uncertainties I think they have going into this fall is, uh, you know, how these school reopenings are going to go and, uh, how voters are going to, who, who voters are going to blame. Um, if we are uh, back in a situation where coronavirus is spiking as a result of these uh, school reopenings. We'll talk about the, the money in that race a little bit. Cornyn's up because he's got tons and tons of money. Texas is a notably expensive state to run in. I think there's 20 or 20 plus media markets. Does Hager have the money to get in this race? That was kind of what was notable about Beto O'Rourke two years ago was that, you know, it was a rare Democrat who had the money to compete statewide and he got, you know, within striking distance of Ted Cruz. Yeah, right now, I mean, there's a huge financial disparity in this race. I think Cornyn has over, I don't know, 14 million cash on hand or something like that. Hager has uh, a tiny fraction of that. And now it should be noted that she had to go through a competitive, a very competitive primary and a very competitive runoff as 12 way primary and then a runoff against state Senator Royce West. Um, so that certainly disadvantaged her in terms of stockpiling money uh, for the general election. And at the same time, Cornyn didn't have a competitive a competitive primary and he won his primary outright. And so things just in terms of that rhythm of the election cycle, things have certainly broken um, Cornyn's way so far. And, and you see that, I think, reflecting the amount of money he's been able to stockpile. Uh, but even setting that aside, you're right. I mean, she has never, uh, you know, had Beto O'Rourke type money or never demonstrated the capacity um, to generate that kind of, uh, you know, grassroots, small dollar, you know, bonanza. Um, but I, you know, at the end of the day, I think that, you know, she will have, um, you know, she, she will have money to, to play in, in some of the, the major media markets. She's not going to be able to saturate them as well as Cornyn, you know, is going to be able to, she's not going to be able to maybe be up in, you know, all the second tier and third tier markets. And even as I pointed out, even some of the, the first tier markets perhaps. Um, but I think that, you know, this race is going to be a lot more, my, my theory of the case in this race is going to be a lot more environmental and subject to the national environment than the 2018 race was, which certainly was impacted by the national environment, um, but was totally the top of the ticket in Texas. Um, and, you know, it was really a race of two uniquely strong personalities with uniquely strong uh, political profiles. That's not to take away from any of the unique characteristics um, or assets that John Corner and MJ Hager may have, but this time around, it just feels like it's a much more environmental and atmospheric race than it may be um, you know, based on any particular, uh, you know, campaign or strength of campaign or profile. Yeah. One of the interesting things here is, the, you know, the environment is a little bit, a little bit fuzzy. You know, I've, I, I have this pet theory of my own that, you know, the, how the schools go is going to be going to tell us a lot about how the elections go. If the opening of schools uh, goes well in terms of the pandemic and in terms of education and all of that, then, you know, it might be better for incumbents. If not, not, um, what do you guys think plays in this election? Is it going to be some version of, is it, is, are, is the big issue Donald Trump? Is the big issue the coronavirus? Is it the recession? Is it police and race and demonstrations? Um, what do you think we're going to be talking about? Or voters are going to be talking about? I mean, I, I don't think we can go into this election without thinking about the recession and the economic impact of the pandemic on people's lives. With so many elections, we know that the economy and healthcare tend to be pretty high up on voters' minds. And this is, we're at a time where both of those things in one way or another are in peril. And you couple that with the ability of children to go to school and the effect that of how the government is handling that has on their perception on how things are going. I think it, those three things to me, without a doubt, are going to be top of mind, sort of separate from the normal consternation someone may or may not have about an incumbent in any office, including the presidency. But I also think that when, you know, obviously all elections are about power. And I think 
to Cassie's point about the suburbs, this is one where we are watching whether there will be a slight shift in power in terms of who is electing whom. And, and when you think about the experiences of Texans based on socioeconomic status, when you think about their experiences based on geography, someone who can keep their kids at home, uh, create a learning pod for them to still see some of their classmates and have a tutor, their gauge on how school reopenings is going is very different to a single mom who has no other option than to send her kids to school because she has to go to work because if she doesn't, she'll lose a job that's already kind of on the line in the uncertainty of the pandemic. And so maybe that mom doesn't have enough headspace to go vote anyway. And, and maybe she won't actually be spurred by all of this to go vote. But I think that when you think about the deciding factors for someone to either vote to begin with or vote one way or another, those things are gonna be vastly different based on, in most cases, socioeconomic status and the way in which the pandemic is affecting their lives. Mm -hmm. Cassie, you got a theory on issues? No, I mean, I think it, it, it all matter. I mean, not all matter, but you, you know, it, all the pieces matter. And I think depending on what level of, what level of the ballot we're talking about, there's gonna be different issues, um, you know, and in what part of the state we're talking about too. Um, you know, the, the police reform and the conversation surrounding, um, you know, and kind of that, that, that took place in the aftermath of the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. Um, how does that play out in some of these races? Um, is it even playing out in terms of it being a, a factor? You know, my personal opinion is yes, to an extent, but then I'm also with Alexa on that, you know, the, the, the things that are going to be at the top of minds of voters are the healthcare conversations, the economic conversations, the school conversations. Yeah. Are you guys hearing, uh, I know we're early in the, I mean, as late as it is and as close as we are to the election, I know we're relatively early in this kind of final leg of the races where the House candidates and the Senate candidates at the state level and then at the um, federal level are really just kind of popping up their heads. You know, the political geeks like us have been paying attention, but normal people kind of check in now. Um, are they talking about the things that we've been talking about, you know, since March, really? Um, or are the campaigns a little bit more local? Or are you, are you really hearing anything out of the campaigns yet where you can tell what the issue sets that the candidates are actually talking about are? Yeah, I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm always curious what the, you know, obviously that the one of the most reliable indicators of a campaign's issue priorities is what they actually decide to spend money on to put on TV and to, you know, put on the radio and on, on digital. And so I'm always curious, you know, what that first TV ad, that first real TV ad is, is saying and what issues they're highlighting. And, you know, we've begun over the past, I don't know, week or two to, to really start seeing the first TV ads and some of these, you know, battleground congressional races. Uh, and they're definitely, um, you know, talking about coronavirus. The Democrats are definitely trying to pair the anxiety and concerns that people have with coronavirus with the narrative that Democrats have already been pushing on healthcare and that they pushed, I think most people would argue, effectively and successfully in 2018 in their, in their push to, to flip the U.S. House nationally or overall, not just in Texas. Um, so I think you're seeing, you know, especially in the Democratic ads, the pairing of those two issues that, you know, that that healthcare narrative with more recent coronavirus related concerns. Um, so, yeah, I think you're starting to see the ads and the paid media reflect uh, some of what us, the, the, you know, the pundits have been talking about. What's the pitch on the Republican side? Is something emerging? That's a good question. I mean, you know, their their message is, you know, going to be that, uh, you know, I think you see this in the Senate race a little bit um, is going to be that when it comes to the, you know, economic recovery um, from the coronavirus, you know, who do you who do you trust more, the the Republican Party or the or the Democratic Party? At least in John Cornyn's race, I think that's the message that he is kind of honing in on. If you if you've been following his public statements in in recent weeks. Um, but there's no doubt that they're being put on on defense on some of these issues, uh, you know, especially in, in some of the down ballot races where coronavirus is, um, you know, very top of mind for voters. And some of these incumbents have been, um, you know, may, have made statements um, that, you know, either, you know, express skepticism of how serious the problem is. They've not always worn masks. And I think that they're learning as we get you know, deeper into the fall here that they're gonna to have to play defense on some of that and, and maybe have a different attitude. 
especially if cases are going to spike again and we're going to have to put in, in place more restrictions in Texas. We're I think one of, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think one of the things that will be interesting to watch, and I say this as someone acknowledging that Cassie and Patrick watch endorsements much more closely than I do, but I think in previous elections, you have seen much more of a rush to get the endorsement of someone like the governor, right? They're in, in some of these low ticket races, there are, there are candidates that voters may not know, but they might remember seeing the governor endorse them, right? Because the governor has a little bit more name ID than, than these, these candidates might. And I think with this pandemic and with the very divided opinion on how the governor is handling it so far, even among members within his party, with, with many of those folks disagreeing, I think it'll be interesting to watch what that endorsement uh, lobby looks like and whether people are hoping for those endorsements from the governor in the same way that they were before the pandemic, given the, the split views on how it's going so far and how his management of it is going so far. Yeah. One, yeah. one last thing about the election I want to ask about. Uh, I want to see what you guys think is going to be the effect of the first election that doesn't have straight ticket voting. You know, it has been the case in Texas that you could go in, pull one lever for the Republicans or a lever for the Democrats, or I guess the Libertarians or the Greens, turn around and walk out of the booth and you voted the whole ballot. Uh, now you can still vote a straight ticket, but you can't do it in one pull. Um, you know, uh, the, the heavy smokers may not make it to the end. And I, I'm curious what happens with the candidates that are a little bit down ballot. If you're running even in a, a lower on the ballot statewide position like a judgeship, or if you're, you know, a sheriff or something like that, how do you think it goes? Anybody jump in? I, I was just going to, before I move on, just add to Alexa's point because I feel strongly about this. I think even though he's not on the ballot this fall, I think the, you know, Abbott is one of the top storylines going into November. Um, you know, I've been here in Austin for, you know, the entirety of his first term and his, and so far his second term. And I can't remember a time when he it was, you know, his image was as politically de destabilized um, as it is now. And as Lexa pointed out, I think that has serious implications um, for, uh, you know, who he affiliates with in some of these down ballot races um, and whether they're willing to uh, back him up on the state's coronavirus handling, which, which so far we haven't seen any notable splits, but in some of these down ballot races, as you pointed out, they're still, you know, they're, they're really still just heating up. And so I just wanted to, you know, emphasize that point. <laughs> yeah, in some ways, he's lucky he got out of the, that the coronavirus was after the Texas primaries, because you didn't have the, you know, if you right. had a Republican primary right now, you would probably have candidates who are campaigning for the governor and against the governor on his responses to the COVID-19. Right. Up until this, you know, this point, you know, he's enjoyed obviously pretty, uh, pretty high statewide approval ratings, statewide favorability ratings. Um, and, you know, at the very least as a campaign surrogate was a kind of do no harm surrogate, if not a, you know, net positive. Now I think that that's, that's thrown into question. Yeah. So what do you think straight tickets going to do? Cassie, what's going to happen down ballot? You need to start with Alexa on this one, Ross. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Alexa, I'll start with Alexa. <laughs> I mean, so here's the thing. It's it's hard to remember this in the middle of a pandemic with so with so much upheaval, but this election was always going to have a level of uncertainty to it, right? Because it was going to be the first one without straight ticket voting. And then before you even get to voters and whether they stand in line, you also have to keep in mind that the lack of straight ticket voting in this election doesn't just affect whether the house flips, it could also affect control of cities throughout the state because the municipal elections from earlier this year were delayed. And so guess what? Now those are tacked onto the bottom of what is already a very, very, very long ballot in a lot of places. And so the question is not only do voters get to their house races, but do voters even get to their city races and control of their city council? And so I, I think, you know, it just feels like everything that local officials have been trying to do to make up for straight ticket voting keeps being impaired. I, I remember talking to uh, election administrators before the pandemic about how they were going to prepare for straight ticket voting. And they told me, you know, we're going to 
identify the locations that are the busiest and we're going to put as many machines as we can because that way we can keep the flow moving we don't end up with these ridiculous lines well guess what now you have to space machines out with six feet between them and the polling locations that you were using before might not actually work and so we have so little uh, certainty about how this is going to go i think you cannot assume that voters afraid of being in a confined space with other voters are going to have the patience to go down every single ballot. That doesn't mean they, every single race, and that doesn't mean they won't, but I just don't think you can assume it. And if we didn't assume people would go through the ballot before a pandemic, we most definitely cannot assume that they will stick it out for the rest of the ballot during a pandemic. And obviously that can make a big difference in some of these smaller races. It also probably means that these candidates can focus on a smaller group of voters, knowing that there are their core voters that they want to get out, and at least they'll have sort of that base to grow from. Right. Not everybody's going to make it to the bottom of the ballot where I'm running, but my friends will, that kind of an argument. Get the, get the friends and family vote down there. Okay, Cassie, <laughs> now Alexa has spoken. What do you think? Oh. Well, I don't know if I can say much more than what Alexa just did, but at, you know, at the state house level, I'm curious, and something that I actually haven't heard a lot about, maybe you've heard um, some, some rumblings about this VTEC, is how um, the lack of straight ticket voting has affected the strategy for some of these down ballot campaigns that we're talking about. Is name ID now more important than ever because that's motivating somebody you know, who's going to vote to, to remember that name and to associate, oh yeah, I need, a, I need a vote for that person. And again, to take it back to Alexa's point, it's just so uncertain at this point and we're not going to know the effects of any of this until, um, what were you saying, Alexa, a week, election week? A week after the election, something like that. So, election week, election, election week, week, election month, election year. It could be, could be the yeah. whole thing. Yeah. So all of this, all of this determines, you know, what the legislature is going to be doing. And the setup for this is, you know, even if this election was boring, it's clearly not. But even if this election was boring, it sets up a really interesting and consequential legislative session. This is the session when. Um, in a normal year with everything on track, we would be doing redistricting. Uh, in a non-normal year with COVID, it means that, you know, in a recession, it means that uh, state revenue is probably going to be down. The amount of money that the state has to write its budget is going to be down, which raises the question of do you have new taxes here or do you cut programs that voters have said they want? And we're starting with only two of the three leaders at the top of state government. And I'll, I'll start with that, with the question about the speaker. Cassie, how do you think this is going to go? So uh, kind of like the theme of today's conversation is obviously what party is going to be, uh, or at least from the state house level perspective, you know, what party is going to be controlling the chamber, uh, AKA which party will the new speaker belong to? And the uncertainty surrounding that question, uh, in my opinion, is largely why you've seen not a single speaker candidate uh, actually formally announce a bid. You know, this time, last speaker's race with uh, Dennis Bonin, so only two years ago, um, we had over a dozen, maybe seven candidates at this point who were actively running speaker campaigns, and we don't uh, have a single one who's declared yet. So for Republicans, uh, and kind of going back to the Dennis Bonin thing, uh, you know, they're trying to reckon with this uh, speaker scandal that kind of uh, defined uh, the lower chamber for the last half of 2019. Um, and so Republicans are considering, you know, or, or they're, they're wondering who was all, all in with the speaker during his scandal, who wasn't, is there a candidate that can bridge the divide that has fractured the GOP caucus? And also, uh, is there a candidate in our caucus who can work well with Democrats? Because, uh, you know, whether or not Democrats uh, end up flipping the chamber completely, there's a very good scenario where that I think I could see playing out where the margin between Republicans and Democrats is even slimmer than what it was this past session. Uh, and then on the Democratic side, uh, you know, you have candidates in that caucus in the House considering, do we want to prioritize rallying around a, a, a candidate of color or a female candidate? And how could we even balance running a house that's run by Democrats and cooperating with Republicans in the Senate, the Republican control chamber there in Abbott? Um, 
So uh, a lot of questions on everybody's mind and, uh, you know, the whole thing kind of looming over it is November. So, uh, you know, my conversations with members recently have been kind of this theory that nobody's going to announce until after the November election, because what's the advantage to doing so at this point? Do you think, you know, with the House relatively close in partisan numbers, whether it's a Democratic House or a Republican House, doesn't that argue against having a uh, uh, one party really picking the speaker? Uh, doesn't it have to be a coalition candidate one way or the other? Um, I mean, sure, yes. Uh, but I think, you know, uh, with, with Bonin, um, yes, was he maybe a little bit further to the right politically, policy-wise than some of his other Republicans who were running, Republican colleagues who were running for speaker? Sure. But he, um, you know, also had a coalition um, when he rolled out his list of 109 House members who had already committed to backing him for speaker, there were uh, dozens of Democrats on that list. Um, so, you know, I think that, you know, don't want to speak for everybody in the House, but I think that the, the strategy on both sides at this point is who is actively trying to court members from the other party just in these early preliminary stages of this race. Yeah. And, and that, I guess it's worth noting too, and, and I know Cassie knows this, but you know, that courtship is one way that courtship is playing out is through the various, you know, political efforts that are currently underway to, to flip the house. You have uh, a multitude of, of Democrat, you know, state-based and, and national, I should add too, but state-based democratic PACs and groups that are focused on uh, flipping the Texas house. Um, and there's no doubt that some potential, you know, speaker candidates are trying to build influence with the speaker's race by being active in those efforts, whether it's through the House Democratic Campaign Committee, whether it's through PACs that they've formed and operated on their own previously or knew this cycle. Um, you know, so that's also, you know, one of, the, I think, the behind the scenes uh, dynamics to watch as well. Yeah, Alexa, the National Democrats and National Republicans really, really care about Texas politics once every 10 years so they can draw maps. And, and going into this legislative session, like I said, in a normal year, we would be grabbing a census and the, you know, one of the top orders of business would be drawing the political maps that are going to be used theoretically for the next 10 years. Uh, but it's not a normal year and this is a mess. Can you walk us through the census and the redistricting and what that might mean for the next, uh, you know, up until maybe this time next year? Yeah, I mean, honestly, normally right now, I would be in like Amarillo or somewhere following the House Redistricting Committee <laughs> as they were touring the state to get input from voters, you know, something that folks might see as sort of an exercise in futility, because as we know, so many of these decisions aren't based off of public input often. Uh, but even the process leading up to redistricting has been different at this point from the interim work that would normally happen. And, and that's not going to change anytime soon. We are watching this fight over the census play out. And unlike the litigation over voting and, and election law, this is one that could go up right up until the line. And so at this moment, I don't think we can say with certainty that we are going to be redrawing maps during the regular legislative session. Counting for the census is supposed to end on September 30th, a month earlier than the Census Bureau had previously announced, though obviously several months after what was supposed to be the original deadline before the pandemic. And the Trump administration is saying that gives us enough time to stay on the timelines that we're normally on and give legislators the data that they need to redistrict their maps and do that in Texas during the regular legislative session. But there are multiple lawsuits ongoing here that could maybe extend counting. And if we do extend counting, then the Trump administration has previously said that under that timeline, they can't get the data to lawmakers in time. And that pushes redistricting into a special session with some asterisks and questions about what happens to the legislative maps versus the congressional maps, but we'll leave those aside for now. And so I think going into the session, you know, normally you have conversations that are happening, you have, um, you know, quiet drawing that's happening with some of the latest census data in preparation for the actual 20, the actual decennial census data. And, and I think at this point, all of that is up in the air and you're 
going and without a doubt some of this is going to play into the litigation that whether maps are drawn during the special session or during a regular session or is going to play out either way. But I think one of the more interesting things is if you're thinking about politics is the rules for when maps need to be drawn, when they're thrown to the legislative redistricting board, when they're thrown to the courts, all of those are also at play. And I think with, if you get, it, it's sort of this like counterintuitive um, sort of spot that we're in because Democrats have been fighting to extend the census, but I think that they actually benefit from getting the data during the regular session because then they can, they have a little bit more power if they were to win the House, say, to leverage between the maps and the budget and all of the sort of things that are in play during a regular legislative session. If the data comes in later and you're in a special session, then I think the Democrats have a little bit less power to, to leverage on some of these maps. Yeah. Let me ask you, while we're talking about census and all of this stuff, you know, the, the consequential part of the census for everybody else who's not in politics, obviously the politics is consequential and the maps are consequential. But it has to do with, you know, what the census does to Texas. This is an audience question. What's the impact for the state if data falls short of the actual numbers? Well, you know, essentially we, for the next 10 years, will be operating off of a base, a formula base that will never meet reality in the state. So the funding formulas that are used for early childhood uh, care are always going to be off and will never fully cover the amount of children that are actually in this state and that are then estimated to be in this state every year in between census. Um, we will not have enough money for uh, where highways are built. Our highway construction uh, plans could be, you know, marred because we will be using bad data. Uh, the grocery store that might have been built in your growing community, if enough people are missed in that community, you know, a grocer is going to look at the data and say, I don't think there's enough people here. Let's move over here where seemingly there are more people. And the disparities of that obviously will play into who is being counted more. And if you if you looked at the map of Texas right before the census started sending people to knock on doors in person, the counties with the highest response, self-response rates at that point were actually the urban blue counties. And you had a lot of rural Texas that was still falling behind. And you had a lot of uh, South Texas that was still falling behind. And so, you know, we saw yesterday, uh, we reported yesterday that the Secretary of State and the state are sort of launching a, a last minute uh, campaign ad, $15 million pulling from the CARES Act funding to do so. Uh, but, you know, I think people think about undercounting and they think about the people who will be undercounted as uh, people who may more likely vote for Democrats. But if you look at those maps, rural Texas is pretty much behind. And if they're missed in the count, that is going to affect all of our funding streams, all of our federal funding streams for the next 10 years. All right. I'm going to just, um, the, I'm going to hop subjects here to get to some of the audience questions. Uh, and any of you can jump at these. Um, I don't know if any of you have looked at it. Are voter registration numbers higher, lower, sideways, do we know from previous years? I assume they're up a little bit because the population's growing, but have you actually looked at them yet? I haven't done the math to compare growth between a normal presidential primary and a November presidential primary, uh, or a presidential general. Um, I haven't quite done the math, but I think without a doubt, anecdotally, I can say that counties have seen pretty big dips in voter registration. You know, think about the way voter registration normally happens. It's in person when you see a voter deputy registrar standing outside your grocery store, or it's at a big event. Um, it's at the MLK marches. It's at July 4th uh, parades and celebrations. We don't have online voter registration. And so unless you are going through those hoops right now, the, the hoops that the state sets out for people to register, you're not registering. Um, and so what I've heard anecdotally from counties is that they've seen pretty big dips and have been trying to work around the limitations of registration in Texas. Um, but I haven't looked at the numbers exactly to look at the rate of growth because obviously total registration isn't something we want to look at because the state is growing every year. Okay. Um, so a couple of prediction questions. I won't get you into you know this race or that race, but um, how many special sessions do you think we're going to need if we have to do redistricting? Well, and Patrick, uh, <laughs> Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said about a month ago that he can see, that he has told his staff to not 
plan any vacations through the end of September of next year because he can see a scenario in which the legislature comes back for two or three sessions. Um, I don't know how many members agree with that prediction, but that is Dan Patrick's prediction. Okay. Either of the other two you want I mean, the, to stab at them? Well, I was going to say the reality is that congressional redistricting has to happen, right? Because there will likely be an undercount and we may or may not get all three new congressional seats we were supposed to get. But even if we got one, this has to happen. And I don't think there's anything that Texas Republicans hate more than the courts trying to draw their maps and fighting over their own maps. And so I, I think we'll be for that matter, yeah. <laughs> sure in, in this case, the Republicans, since they're in control, uh, I think we'll be in as many special sessions as it takes to at least get a congressional map out. Okay, Patrick, you want to stab at that? Like three special sessions, sure. Okay. Um, turnout higher or lower? And I'm curious what you think the, the composition of it's going to be. And, and, and here's what I mean by that. Do you think more people are going to vote early? Do you think more people are going to vote absentee? And then do you think more people are going to vote? So sort of a multivariate. But I, I'm, I'm curious how you guys think this election environment and this pandemic and all the other things um, will change the way people vote. Uh, I don't I don't think I can say with any certainty that turnout as a percentage of voters against total registered voters will change. Um, I think it easily will probably be in the high marks that we have seen in the recent past, but I don't know that it'll skyrocket up. And the reason I have that uncertainty is because of the uncertainties around the voting process. I do think more people will vote by mail. We know that already. We've seen it in the numbers of applications that the counties are seeing. In Harris County, I'm gonna mess up the exact numbers, but between the primary and the runoff, they saw a pretty big jump in new applications for voting by mail. And at one point, while they were still receiving applications, they had 17,000 applications, new applications that were gonna roll into November. So I think without a doubt, you are going to see, be seeing more people vote by mail. Um, I think I, I would be shocked if we didn't see a higher turnout during early voting, not only because it's a longer period, uh, but because there is a lot of work going into uh, really urging people to vote early. And, and I think there's, you know, normally a voter might say, well, I like to vote on election day. I'm going to wait on election day. This time around, you're probably trying to avoid a crowded place. You're, tr you're probably trying to figure out when can I go vote when I don't have to worry about my health uh, and my safety. And so I, I think that that may play into some of the um, decisions voters might make. So definitely an increase in vote by mail, definitely an increase in the share of people voting early instead of on election day. I don't know about overall turnout. Okay, either of the other two of you want a piece of that? Well, I was just going to add, a, maybe Alexa has a specific numbers. I don't have them in front of me, but we did see, I think if you're looking for higher turnout, we did see some promising signs during the primary runoffs in July. Um, you know, the at least on the Democratic side, I believe the turnout rate um, was a little higher than it has been for similar Democratic primary runoff cycles in, in recent memory. Um, but, you know, that was just one one data point. Uh, certainly gave, I think, Democrats some uh, some hope. Um, but, you know, translating that to a, you know, a general election, um, you know, may not be as easy as it sounds. What do you think, Cassie? I think what those two said. <laughs> did, did we get a, a prediction from Cassie on the number of special sessions? I didn't hear a prediction. I feel like she just cited she, Dan she Patrick. Quoted, she quoted Dan Patrick and did kind of a nice fuzzy thought, little thing. I here. thought that the Dan Patrick prediction would be helpful for our audience. <laughs> Okay. That's why I brought it up. Wow. She's siding against us with the audience. How about that? Uh, uh, Cassie, you, one of the things that you cover um, when you're not covering politics is the state budget. And this prospect of going into a legislative session, we've got a couple of things going on. This is, you know, we're just coming out of the first kind of test of what uh, cities and counties and school districts are going to do with property tax increases after the reforms of 2019. Um, we're going into a legislative session where everybody's just assuming right now that Glenn Hager, the controller, is going to start by saying, you don't have any money, good luck. Um, and, and, you know, it'll almost certainly be um, a conversation. Um, can you talk us kind of quickly through some of the things that play in the budget and, and with an eye on 
whether any of those will be on voters' minds or might be on voters' minds when they go vote in November. Yeah, you know, one of the, the big things that I think a, a few, a couple reporters have already kind of reported on uh, for us is, uh, you know, the 5% budget cut that Greg Abbott and Dan Patrick and Dennis Bonin issued to certain state agencies uh, and higher education institutions during the interim. And um, I think, uh, you know, one of uh, just a number of health related cuts are um, already underway or being proposed. And so I think um, that that's something that is just kind of going to continue to, to get a lot of uh, traction at the legislature. Uh, do we have to even cut deeper um, into those agencies that are already, some would argue, underfunded? Um, you know, Hager has told lawmakers that they are going to have roughly a $4.6 billion deficit. Uh, when they come back. And that's to, for the current budget. Um, some lawmakers, and Hager has even kind of alluded to this, that it could be worse uh, and that the outlook could be worse when they write their next two-year budget. Um, so it's a little bit murky right now just in terms of what kind of numbers and how much money lawmakers are going to have to work with. Uh, you know, Hager, when he issued this, this updated revenue forecast in July, and it's already he, um, with his latest sales tax numbers yesterday, uh, revenue numbers yesterday, he said that uh, this was already had been tweaked. But, you know, just that there's so much uncertainty here with everything coronavirus related and that his predictions were already based on the assumption that there would be no more uh, that, that uh, restrictions on businesses and the economy would be over by the end of the year and whatnot. So um, a lot kind of uh, at play at this point in time. Uncertainty ahead. So going to be like the rest, like the year's been so far, I guess. Um, looks like we're about out of time here. I uh, want to thank my colleagues here, Alexa Ura, Patrick Svitek, Cassie Pollock, and I'll turn it back to our host. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you again to our friends, Ross, Alexa, Patrick, and Cassie from the Texas Tribune for their timely insight, analysis, and expertise. We have a lot to consider as realtors, as Texans, and as voters. If you don't already get the Texas Tribune's email newsletters, visit texastribune.org to sign up. You know, our panelists talked all about the factors injecting uncertainty this election, and each of those factors by itself would indeed be significant, but taken together, it's maybe the most uncertain and highest stakes election ever. However, we heard in our political involvement committee meeting last week that this uncertainty can be our organization's advantage. Candidate fundraising is down, but we have a powerful PAC, and we have the grassroots power of nearly 130,000 members across this great state. But that's only if we make it true. So keep investing in Tree PAC. <clears throat> Contact your realtor-supported candidates and help them on their campaigns. They need it. And most importantly, vote. Before we move to the public policy portion of this morning's session, let me tell you about two great ways you can specifically get engaged with Texas Realtors. Number one, sign up for the Realtor Party Mobile Alerts Program. I'm about to give you a number you'll want to write down, so go grab your pen, but just in case, it will be on the screen shortly in a video too. Just text the phrase TX Realtors no spaces to the number 30644 and you'll be signed up to receive important timely advocacy alerts like election reminders and calls for action. Another way you can get engaged is to visit texasrealtorsupport.com. This website has the realtor supported candidates that will be on your ballot in the November election. Now we'll take just a moment to show two commercials about these programs while we gear up for the pop public policy portion of this morning's session. Good morning, fellow realtors. I'm Jeff Kahn from Lubbock, your 2020 Vice Chair of Public Policy. 
After that fascinating look at the upcoming elections with the Texas Tribune, we're going to look a little further ahead to the next legislative session, which one way or another will begin January 12th, 2021. Today, we'll speak with someone who has a wealth of experience in that world. Now, we've got a few moments before our speaker will join us. So if you're on your computer, please open a new tab right now, go to census.gov and complete that census. We have until the end of this month to get that in and we need everyone counted. So make sure you go do that census.gov. You have our permission to stop watching this, go over and fill that in. And we have some people outside of Texas counts for you too. Texas Realtors is grateful to be joined by Speaker Pro Tem Joe Moody, who represents the 78th House District in El Paso and was first elected to the Texas Legislature in 2008. He currently serves as Vice Chair of the Calendars Committee, serves on the Committees on Business and Industry, Redistricting, and Criminal Jurisprudence. In addition, he was appointed to serve on the Select Committee on Mass Violence and Community Safety. Representative Moody's legislative work has touched on topics from veterans issues and mental health to education and equality, but his passion has been criminal justice reform. His work has earned him numerous accolades, including awards from the Mexican American Legislative Caucus, the Texas District and County Attorneys Association, the Combined Law Enforcement Associations of Texas, the Meadows Mental Health Policy Institute and Equality Texas. Now, many of you are wondering why we are talking about lots of issues. We just had our public policy forum just a few week, days ago. We want to talk to someone who is absolutely at the helm of everything that's going on. And so we'll get him on here in just a few minutes. But while you're here, you're watching online, click over a new tab because we know you're filling out your census right now at census.gov. Go to knowyourtaxes.org. It's important that we as realtors inform our clients about what's going on and educate them on the tax process. And you'll remember over the years, TREPAC has led our advocacy to make sure that we have a clear understanding of our taxes. So go to knowyourtaxes.org, K-N-O-W, knowyourtaxes.org, and make sure you get information on the tax campaign. Recently, our public policy committees met and decided the public priority public policy priorities that we will be having for next year. Now, there's still a lot of time between now and January 12th, whenever the session starts. So there'll maybe be some few additions, but your staff, the governmental affairs staff and all the volunteers are working hard to make sure that Texas property rights and, and are protected and that we have rules in place and in our advocacy is in place to make sure that Texas realtors are protected. In just one minute, I'm being told that uh, we're, our guest is going to be in the green room. He's coming here shortly. So if you haven't already, go to census.gov, fill out the census, go to knowyourtaxes.com, or excuse me, knowyourtaxes.org. Check that out. Look at the local information there. In just one moment, we will have Representative Moody. So stand by in just one second. Special thanks to the staff for working behind the scenes. There's a little war room that I can see that there's a room full of people who are working hard to make sure that we have everything we need. As a reminder, the legislative session starts on January 12th, but there's a lot of work that's happening between now and then. So we're gonna get some insight from Representative Moody shortly to figure out what's going on and how in the world of COVID we're gonna get anything done in the Texas legislature. So just one moment, we're gonna stand by as Representative Moody joins us. Representative Moody, thank you so much for joining us today. First things first, Representative Moody, your Hi, bio says- uh, Thank you. Uh, absolutely. Your bio on Twitter, which I, I love, says you're a time travel enthusiast. So what do you think of the theory that time travel is real and 2020 is a result of a time traveler who keeps trying to fix things and unwittingly making it all worse, kind of like when I try to fix something at the house? Uh, I mean, it seems a, a plausible explanation as anything else to explain how bad this year has gone. So uh, hopefully they'll get it right real soon and we can get back on track would be my hope. Absolutely. Well, let's talk about more concrete near future. Before COVID-19 pandemic emerged, it appeared the biggest task facing the 87th legislature was going to be redistricting and some healthcare reform. However, now there's been an explosion of concerns that we're hearing from our members. And I expect that you and your colleagues around the state have been hearing from your constituents. 
What are Texans mostly talking about that the legislature might address when you reconvene in January? Well, as, as you might expect, we've got uh, health care issues that are going to sit as a major, uh, uh, a major issue that we have to confront. Access to health care, I think, is going to come front and center. Uh, we have uh, criminal justice reform issues, policing reform issues that I think have also taken center stage. Uh, you've, you're going to have a budget issue, that, you know, budget shortfall that sits over the top of all of that. So that always brings in a lot of other uh, discussions about you know, our tax structures and, and fees and fines and everything else in terms of revenue. And so that's a, uh, you know, and then you also have the, the mainstays, you know, public education, higher education, those things don't go away. And in fact, that probably become more pronounced because of the issues they are, they're facing as well. Absolutely. Now, this is less of a Texas legislative question in the short term, but already we're getting questions from our members in the audience about the president and the CDC's emergency orders to halt evictions. Well, I'm sure you're still learning about it in real time, just like we are. What's your first take on that? Look, I mean, I think that you have to address uh, the very real short term crisis that we're in. And I, and I, this is a this is a tool that we have, but if you're going to provide that relief for for tenants, then you have to also uh, look at the balancing that for, for, for landlords as well. And so uh, that is it's not a it's not a one way street; it's a two way street. And so uh, we have a lot of interest to balance, and we need to we need to do it in a way that's that's economically viable for everyone involved in those relationships. This is a this is not a a single problem that can be fixed with one, you know, one moratorium. This is a multifaceted problem that is going to have continuous impacts in our economy. And we have to, add, like, to your point, we have to watch this as it evolves day by day uh, to address those issues as best we can. Because you can't, you know, uh, you know, on one side, you don't want everyone tossed out for eviction but you need to figure out how to balance that with uh, with, with, with uh, landlord's rights as well. It's a, it is a very complicated uh, problem and it's, it, it's one that I, I think we're going to take, it's going to take some time to work through. Absolutely. And we at the Texas Realtors, we agree with you 100%. We want to make sure that similar protections are provided to housing providers since many of the rental properties are owned by mom and pop investors like myself who are required to meet our financial obligations even if they cease to receive rental income on their properties. And for me, I woke up to a text this morning to a tenant who saw that news and said, hey, Jeff, I don't have to pay you any rent. I haven't had time to dive into that. So that I'm personally invested in making sure we have a resolution to this. But let's move back on to more COVID related things for the legislature for next year. Thinking about big ticket items that you're going to have to address with including budget shortfalls, health care and criminal justice reform. What chances do you give any file bills not related to those items? I, I, I think the the mechanics of passing a bill in a non-pandemic time are complicated enough, right? The, the system itself is built not to pass legislation, but to uh, probably kill most of it. And so add on top of that a system in which we don't know what it's going to look like when we're meeting. We don't know what how committees will do their business because we haven't engaged in that during this interim at all. And so uh, if you're not working on an, an item that I would categorize as addressing the two major crises that we're facing, economic and health, if you're not working on something like that and it doesn't directly address the, the, those dual, uh, dual problems, then it's going to be hard to you know, kind of elbow into some space in this particular session. Uh, if I were working on something, I'd make sure that it touches one or both of those. Uh, I'd, I'd look at it, you know, look at something through the lens of does this help Texas recover? Is this part of a Texas recovery plan? If it is, then it has a place at the table. If it doesn't, uh, then, you know, I, I think it'll have to wait for another day. And, you know, qu quite honestly, that may be a good thing for the Texas legislature. We've wasted a massive amounts of time on 
on on bills that that don't matter, that that suck up a lot of oxygen, and ultimately are meant for more politics than real policy. So hopefully, you know, in a strange way, we can scrape some of those things aside and get down to 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 really handling you know a, a, a multifaceted crisis. Absolutely. The most fascinating thing you said to me was this process is meant to kill bills. That's very interesting. In a typical interim year like we're in now in 2020, the legislature's committees study issues and hold hearings around the state. You really haven't been able to do that this year, correct? And what does that mean for the overall preparedness for next session? And given the pandemic and everything else, how much of our interim study have we just scrapped away anyways? Yeah, I mean, I... I haven't been to Austin in six months, probably the longest period of time I've spent away from the Capitol since I've served in the legislature, in my decade in the legislature. And so, uh, yeah, that's it's bound to have ripple effects. I think others are kind of working through the same problems. You're not, uh, you're not having that dialogue, that constant conversation that you use to ramp up into session, particularly if you're dealing with an issue that has you know, it has some roadblocks or you have to have some stakeholder meetings or you've got to get some consensus around things. Uh, those conversations are happening in formats like this, which is great. And I love seeing you on uh, on digital platform, but it's not the same as sitting down with you, uh, reading your body language, understanding kind of where things really are. Uh, this is a, in a policy making is very much built on the human interaction. And we're, we're, there's no, no doubt in my mind that we're going to see a ripple effect in, in how the legislature uh, unfolds next session because we've been deprived of these opportunities. Absolutely. Well, that question kind of leads us into our next question. The Texas legislature only meets for 140 days every other year. This means in a short and intense session that seems to rely on relationships, trust, and honest communication. We hear so much about the partisanship in Washington, but Texas doesn't quite operate that way. What examples come to mind when you've worked with colleagues that maybe on paper are ideologically different than you, whether Republican or Democrat or from a city or rural area? You know, the best example I could use is the work that I've done on criminal justice reform. Uh, that is a that is a, a, a policy arena that is bipartisan. It, you know, justice doesn't doesn't really you know, doesn't belong to one party or another. Uh, although, in some ways, people are attempting to politicize it in today's environment. Uh, you know, in this interim, about a year ago, we created the Criminal Justice Reform Caucus, which is comprised of thirteen Republicans and thirteen Democrats. That's not by mistake. That is intentional to show that urban rural. Uh, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. These are issues that are important. We need equal justice in, in the state of Texas. And so that's, that's been one of the greatest examples that I could can see. And I, I think actually in a session like we're going to be in with the, you know, a, you know, with the additional social crisis we've seen in terms of race and justice, I think you'll see that issue front and center this next session. And there's a lot of good relationships already built to do that work. Absolutely. Well, luckily, and we're, we're very grateful for this, that the Texas legislature has been able to well, mostly maintain that unique camaraderie up to now. But if you are not able to be in the mix with your colleagues, their staff, meeting in person, how will you get work done? Are you worried about the keyboard warrior effect where the distance created by online interaction may be contrary to consensus building? Yeah, I, that concerns me a lot. And I'm like everybody else on my device every day, flipping through Twitter, uh, which is a cesspool for the most part. Uh, and, and I see, and I do see it. I see colleagues of mine uh, biting back and forth at each other in ways that I don't think they would do if they were sitting in the same room with each other. We're going to have to, there's going to be some healing that's going to have to take place uh, when we get back to work in January because a lot of those relationships may have been frayed, may have been damaged. Um, and that those are real those are real problems. 
and this is a, a business in which human interaction is important. It's critical to being able to do the job that we do. Um, you know, a very good friend of mine who serves in the legislature told me, if you don't care about the people you serve with and their lives outside the building, you will never accomplish good things with them inside the building. And, and I think we've, you know, I think given the, you know, it, it seems like our only outlet is social media and Twitter and things like this. And, and it, I really do think we've damaged, there's some damaged relationships and we're going to have to figure, we're going to figure that out uh, in, in a very real way and in a very quick way. Absolutely. Maybe everyone should stop and put Twitter down for a little bit and just focus on the issues and focus on uh, the Texas citizens for a little bit. If, if the worst were to happen and the Capitol remains closed for 2021, or even if the building's open, but limited, uh, open on a limited basis, as you know, the Texas realtors love to be involved. How can our members best stay involved with you and your colleagues in this virtual world? And will that have an impact on the legislative process? Uh, they're going to have to. They're going to have to because they're the experts, right? I, as an attorney, I can certainly, uh, you know, I've certainly received, you know, real, uh, real um, interesting legal theories from people who are non-lawyers. So I'm sure people in the, in, in the in in and around the realtors have heard very interesting things from people that are not in your profession. You've got to be engaged, and if it means I tell you, and I got a text from a, a friend of mine who's a prominent realtor here in, in El Paso just right now. And so those types of connections, those relationships that you've built up until now, those are the ones that you're going to be able to utilize uh, in a situation like this, because you'd be able to text, pick up the phone and call, get on a, a meeting like this, because the typical face-to-face -face interaction, I think, depending on the office, is going to uh, be different. I may have certain rules in my office that aren't the same with the, the person next door. And you know as well as I do in, in session, sometimes you're just wandering down the hallway and you go, oh, I got an idea. Let me wander into this person's office. And that, that, that dynamic is probably going to be largely missing this session. So um, all the relationships you've got right now, the personal connections you have right now to your legislators uh, locally, uh, ramp them up right now because those will be some of the the those will be the lifelines that that people like me will need when we're making you know very you know big decisions in a uh, in a, what is going to be one of the most difficult sessions we've ever faced. Absolutely. Last week we were talking with uh, your El Paso colleague, Representative Mary Gonzalez, and she informed us that if January is the first time we represented it or hearing from you, it's not a good thing. You've got to hear from them earlier. So what would you suggest the Texas Realtors and our concerned members? How do you want us to communicate with you? Is it better phone calls or Zooms like this, handwritten letters? That's in the absence of just showing up in your office like we're inclined to do from time to time. I, um, carrier pigeon, if you want to <laughs> put it. No, I, you know, and I'm, I'm very lucky and I'm sure a lot of my colleagues have the same fortune. The, the association of realtors here in El Paso are extremely proactive. They meet with us routinely. They keep us up to date on what they have going on, invite us down to the office from time to time. So, it's not a relationship that ever disappears, whether we're in session or not. It's a consistent, uh, it's a consistent relationship, uh, uh, allowing us to to have that open channel of communication. Make sure that it's a two way street, and it's a uh, it's been it's been very good for people like me, and I'm sure Mary felt the same way. But she is right. If that's if the first call you're making is on January first. Uh, 2021, uh, it might be problematic, uh, but I can say we don't have that problem. We don't have that problem in El Paso, not with the great, with the Greater El Paso uh, Association of Realtors. This is, it, it's a group that, from the second I became a candidate for office, has always kept in great communication, because I mean, ultimately, their core issues are wrapped up in the the economy of our community. And so it's important for them to weigh in. 
And so it's, it's been a good relationship, a healthy relationship and, and just continue to do that. Um, continue to, to make sure that you're uh, offering your expertise in, in these difficult times. Absolutely. I think the Google search for carrier pigeon services in Austin, Texas just went through the roof. We have one very important last question. Let's assume the legislature gets to convene in the 87th legislative session. Have you picked out your socks for that special day? And for those who are wondering why I'm asking this, Representative Moody's unparalleled fashion scene, including his sock game, is well known in legislative circles. Uh, <laughs> I haven't picked out opening day socks yet, but now that it seems like there's a, a, mount, a, a, a mounting pressure to, to, to do it right. You know, I've got, I've got Tupac and, and Biggie socks. Uh, I've got some other ones that are probably would violate the rules of decorum. And so I got to be careful with that too. But um, I, I'll, I'll, I'll give it some thought in the next couple of weeks and make sure that we do it right. <laughs> I can't wait to see that photo on Twitter. Representative Moody, we so appreciate you making the time for joining us today. Thank you for your expertise and best of luck in 2021. Thank you all very much. I appreciate the invitation and certainly am grateful for the work that you all do day in and day out. We're going to need your expertise more than ever. So thank you. Absolutely. And to our governmental affairs staff, maybe we should send him some tree pack socks. I think those would look good on the first day of the Capitol. Fellow Texas Realtors, it's been an honor to host this incredible session with insight from so many people engaged in Texas politics and public policy. Realtors are certainly at the table for these discussions, and that's exactly what we mean when we say Texas Realtors are shaping Texas. Please enjoy the rest of the 2020 Texas Realtors Conference, and we'll see you soon. Hello, Texas Realtors. We're looking forward to seeing all of you this evening at our Tree Pack Lone Starry Night event. You won't want to miss our special guest, actor and comedian Sinbad, along with our Tree Pack virtual online auction. That's right, Tony. Tonight at 6 p.m. Central, we'll be hosting this fabulous event in support of the best pack in the Lone Star State. We'll do a little bit of fundraising and have a whole lot of fun. Wait, Cindy, just so I'm clear, you and I are hosting the event, right? We're not actually roasting Sinbad because I have a feeling he'll get the last laugh on that one. No, silly. I said we'll be hosting the event. Make sure you're part of this fun and exciting event tonight at 6 p.m. Central. Then, don't forget to sign up to bid in our tree pack auction. We have more than 100 items to choose from. Go to texasrealestate.com slash auction right now to start bidding. The auction will close tonight at the end of our program. So get ready to laugh, Texas Realtors. We'll, we'll see, see you tonight. tonight.